Good morning. Um, just raise your hand if you can't hear me through the mask, but I will try to speak loudly. Uh, welcome. Uh, this uh, talk is going to be about optimizing management of traumatic hemorrhage. Uh, time for a platform clinical trial. Um, we would like to highlight a couple things. So number one, uh, this is a complex topic that requires a lot of different experts, and we want to give due credit to the experts. Um, it was a multidisciplinary group spanning uh, many time zones, uh, and we appreciate our sponsorship both from uh, the research committee and the trauma interest group as well. Um, it is also the <laughs> content we're going to be trying to cover is actually three papers worth, so it will be um, a very uh, superficial overview, but I hope it's enough to get you guys interested in the topic. Uh, the three-part series will be published in Transfusion uh, soon as part of the THOR supplement, that's the Traumatic Hemostasis and Oxygenation Research Network. Um, so do look out for that um, if you feel like we aren't able to have the time to get into particular aspects of this, um, the, that three-part uh, paper uh, series does. Uh, will give you, hopefully, uh, more information. Uh, in terms of disclosures, uh, Dr. Tolles uh, uh, does uh, provide some uh, services to Barry Consultants, and I have no disclosures. Um, and what we're going to try to cover today is, is uh, in some sense, all three papers. Um, the first is the rationale and design of a platform trial for traumatic hemorrhage, or the why we should be doing this. Um, the implementation of such a trial, uh, or the how. Uh, and then if we have time, uh, we'll try to get into the, regula the U.S. regulatory uh, issues, uh, as well as the general ethics of doing uh, a complex trial like this in traumatic hemorrhage. So I will turn it over to Dr. Tolles. Great. All right. Uh, just before we get started, I'm curious by a show of hands, how many of you are kind of familiar with what an adaptive platform trial is? Great. So we get to be the ones to introduce you to the idea. I'm excited. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Well, first of all, to talk about traumatic hemorrhage, I don't think I have to say a lot to convince you that this is an important clinical area, an important topic to do research. It's the leading cause of death for young people in the U.S., ages 1 to 44. Most preventable deaths occur in the early phases of resuscitation and even pre-hospital. And this means that there are a lot of therapeutic targets, both in terms of the setting, pre-hospital, emergency department, operating room, critical care, as well as various modalities of treatment, which we're going to talk about, you know, hemorrhage control, transfusion, management of coagulopathy, surgical techniques. So despite the importance of this topic, we don't have a lot of really solid randomized clinical trial evidence for a lot of the therapies we provide. I think you've heard of the big randomized trials for which we do have evidence, you know, TXA, the CRASH-2 trial. Proper, which gives us the one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one transfusion ratio, Pamper and Combat, which taught us about pre-hospital plasma, and then there is also one very large uh, RCT of hypertonic saline, which actually showed no effect, which is um, why you're probably not using it. However, there are a whole bunch of other therapies out there that we are using in various settings that don't have a lot of evidence. This includes things like whole blood, TAG, Reboa, resuscitative thoracotomy, various treatments for coagulopathies, as well as surgical techniques and hemostatic devices. So we have a large patient population potentially exposed to therapies that don't have a lot of evidence behind them. Well, you know, you might say, okay, yeah, but like RCTs are really expensive and they're hard to do and they take forever, so why do we even need them? Um, does anybody know what this is? Yeah, those are medical anti-shock trousers. Um, the reason you don't know what they are is because people aren't using them anymore. But there was a time when, you know, theoretically, they seemed to make a lot of sense and people were using them. Basically, they apply pressure to the lower extremities and give you up to like a 20% auto transfusion, and so people's blood pressure went up and they were used for sorts of traumatic indications. But it turned out that even though people's blood pressure went up, um, their outcomes were better, and you tended to get like compartment syndrome and ischemia in your limbs, which was very bad. So this is why we do RCTs, because things that may make physiologic sense, theoretical sense, are not always the best things for our patients. Okay, but 
I do acknowledge that RCTs, especially traditional randomized clinical trials, are inefficient and can be quite expensive. Imagine if I was interested in studying a couple different things related to trauma resuscitation. Maybe I'm interested in looking at whole blood versus one-to-one-to-one. -to -one -to -one. I'm kind of interested in different ways of managing coagulopathy. What would that series of trials look like? Well, the first trial, maybe I do whole blood versus one-to-one-to-one. -to -one -to -one. And then I'm interested in how TEG interacts with that, so maybe in my second trial, I'm going to do whole blood and TEG versus one-to-one-to-one. -to -one -to -one then another you know, combination that I'm going to look at fibrinogen concentrate, and on and on and on. And this is more than a whole career in research that you could possibly do. Um, and you know, I'll be long retired by the time you do all these trials. But this is the way we conduct clinical trials these days. Most trials are still two-arm comparisons, standalone, um, and it's very inefficient and expensive. So we are here to advocate for a better, more efficient way to do things for our patients. So what is an adaptive platform trial? An adaptive platform trial is designed to simul simultaneously evaluate multiple treatment modalities for a disease or a group of related diseases. So think broadly. So this is not just two arms, two treatments, a, a particular area of inquiry like transfusion. And this is not just one patient population. This trial can learn about all sorts of different modalities targeting similar or related patient populations. And we allow for treatment effects to vary between clinically distinct subgroups. So that means the same trial in traumatic hemorrhage could include patients with traumatic brain injury and patients without traumatic brain injury. And we don't necessarily assume the treatments affect them. We're not going to affect them similarly. We're not going to pool the results. We're going to learn from the two treatment groups but still be able to make independent inferences. Um, interventions are often administered in combination, and I'll get to that. And lastly, an adaptive platform trial employs adaptive design features. So these are things like response adaptive randomization, where patients are preferentially randomized to the better performing treatment, um, dropping treatments for futility if they don't seem like they're going to be effective, graduating treatments from the trial and bringing them to be the standard of care and as well as the addition of new treatments or domains as they become available. And what that means is that the trial can accommodate treatments that didn't even exist when you set it up. It's able to bring in new ideas and new technology as they're, able, as they're developed. And I, you know, it might sound sort of obvious that an adaptive platform trial employs adaptive features, but there are similar but distinct related types of trials called master protocols that are not really adaptive trials. They share sort of an operational infrastructure, but they run kind of a series of one-to-one -one trials back-to-back. -back. And those are slightly different, and they don't have quite the same set of efficiencies. So I just put that in there as a distinction. OK, so is anybody doing this in the real world yet? Yes, they are, and they have been for a while. iSpy2 is probably one of the oldest adaptive platform trials. It's a neoadjuvant therapies for breast cancer trial. Uh, but we also have things like GVM Agile, which is a trial for glioblastoma multiforming, um, Remap Cap, which is a trial for community acquired pneumonia and actually activated its pandemic appendix for COVID and um, was able to produce uh, inferences about treatments for COVID, and then the Together COVID 19 trials. There are a whole bunch more that you may have heard of, but people are out there, they're doing this type of trial, and especially with COVID, it actually gained increased acceptance and interest. Okay, let's go over some adaptive platform trial vocabulary before I jump into how it would actually work. So in an adaptive platform trial, we have a stratum, which is a disease subpopulation over which you would stratify randomization. So in this trial, it would be something like patients with traumatic brain injury, patients without traumatic brain injury. A domain, which is a category of therapy. So in a traditional trial, you'd really only be doing one domain, like transfusion. Whereas here, you may be doing multiple domains, so transfusion, hemostasis agents, surgical techniques, those are areas of investigation. And within each domain, you have a factor, which is what would be a treatment arm in a traditional trial. So those are the specific things that the patients are randomized to. And then the regimen is the collection of factors to which a patient is randomized. So this is how this would be working in operation. So starting over here, you've designed your trial, you're gonna enroll patients. 
and each patient is randomized separately within each domain. And the beauty of this is if a patient is not eligible for a particular domain, no problem, that patient isn't randomized. Or if a patient maybe isn't eligible yet for a particular domain, like you don't know if they're gonna have a surgery yet, they can be randomized, but that treatment is only revealed later if and when they become eligible. So the individual regimens are gonna look something like this. So patient one gets transfusion strategy A, coagulopathy strategy C, hemostasis strategy D. And then patient two gets a separate combination. We record the outcomes, and then we update our statistical model and, and apply our pre-specified adaptation rules. So an adaptive trial doesn't mean you make it up as you go along. You write everything in advance, how, how you're gonna decide when to drop treatments, when to graduate treatments. This all has to be written out so the properties can be understood statistically. So after you apply your pre-specified rules, then you might drop poorly performing factors saying, look, this is never gonna show benefit over control, so we're gonna drop it and allow our patients to be randomized to other arms in the trial and then you continue. So this is very efficient because treatments cycle in and out of the trial very seamlessly and you're able to um, bring in, bring your patients to new therapies as they become available, drop them from less promising therapies. So how would this look specifically in this treatment area? And again, we developed this in collaboration with people who are much more expert in the treatment of trauma than I am. So these are sort of the, the factors they came up with. Um, that they might consider. So for transfusion strategy, you might have your control be what we do now, which is one to one to one. Um, a first experimental arm be low, tighter, liquid, cold stored blood. And a second experimental arm be whole, whole fresh blood. Coagulopathy, again, a variety of treatment options, including TAG, fibrinogen. And then for hemorrhage control, you might consider as your control, stop the bleed interventions and your experimental arms, something like wound packing or injectable agents. So I promised you these were more efficient than traditional clinical trials. And there are really two main categories of efficiency. The statistical efficiencies are the most important part for adaptive platform trials and the distinction from things like master protocols. The shared control group, meaning within a particular domain, you have one control arm and you're doing multiple experimental treatments against that arm, that saves you a control group over each you know, one to one trial you would have done in series otherwise. Um, we are able through modeling to do dynamic borrowing across heterogeneous subgroups. So what that means, and I'll, I'll just sort of simplify it, is that depending on how similar groups look in their results, there will be more or less shrinkage of that treatment effect estimate towards the kind of center. So if it looks like patients with TBI behave similarly to a transfusion strategy to those without, the treatment effect will kind of be estimated using information from both groups. If it looks like they're behaving differently, they'll actually be estimated more independently. But we don't have to decide that up front. We can decide that as the model learns how the subjects are behaving. Response adaptive randomization, preferentially allocate subjects to better performing arms, and therefore you learn more quickly what the treatment effect is on those arms. And then of course you have the stopping rules where you drop treatments from the trial and add new treatments in. Operational efficiencies, um, this is you know, obvious to anybody who's participated in a clinical trial, ramping up, teaching your staff, familiarizing your center with what you're doing is a huge part of getting a trial moving and can be very inefficient. So when you have this perpetually running trial, you're able to preserve institutional memory and momentum and keep your, your protocol sort of dynamic. Um, so that's my pitch for APTs, and Kabir is going to tell you how we'll get this tremendously complex thing done. I will certainly try, okay. All right, so uh, how would you do this? So uh, again, just to, to reiterate, um, the, the goal here is to use data collected during the course of the trial to iteratively refine how the trial is being conducted. Um, various parameters in a pre-specified manner will uh, be adjusted to improve the care of the subjects within the trial. Um, and again, since we're looking at a broad heterogeneous population, we're gonna be including both pediatric and adult subjects with both penetrating and blunt trauma. So, if you were to hypothetically create this study, um, you would be looking at inclusion criteria, 
would be any patient with major traumatic injury meeting uh, local uh, trauma transport criteria. They'd have to have evidence of full life-threatening hemorrhage to be included, and you'd want to have uh, time of injury at least uh, uh, less than, uh, or no, no more than six hours, and we'll talk a little bit uh, more about why that is. Uh, and then things that you would probably want to exclude from a trial like this would be uh, uh, patients that already had a traumatic arrest, uh, known membership in a group that would likely object to one of the study treatments that you'd be randomizing to, um, and then uh, neurologic in injuries uh, considered incompatible with survival. Um, so there is a consensus definition for traumatic hemorrhage outcomes, and that is a six-hour all-cause mortality. That would be than your primary outcome, but you'd also be considering more patient-centered outcomes, uh, like 28-day uh, uh, outcome uh, mortality for all causes, um, and then you could think about other ones that are more like uh, disability and, and uh, functional status. So what are your key considerations that you really need to understand when you're thinking about a trial um, like, a, a, like a platform trial? And, and these honestly are things that you should consider with any uh, randomized control trial. It's just more uh, important in a, in a platform trial because of the, the types of uh, efficiencies we're trying to get to. So, so number one is that you want to identify the high-risk patients that are most likely to benefit uh, from your treatment. So what we know from, uh, from military studies is that um, a lot of patients die within the first hour of injury. And those are the ones uh, that you would want to have the ability to intervene on. The problem is, is that if we're enrolling patients that only survived after that first hour of injury, you're not really targeting the therapies and you're not going to know what the benefits are for the, for the truly um, high risk population. Uh, it's something called left truncation. Um, and so the goal of doing this uh, study would be to try to target the earliest injured patients. Um, and that is obviously a challenge, uh, whether you're doing a, an RCT or a platform trial, um, but if you were gonna do a platform trial, the amount of effort you wanna, you'd be expending to set up these, this uh, system, you'd wanna make sure you're trying to target the highest risk patients most likely to benefit. When it comes to site selection, um, an, an adaptive platform trial is gonna be very strict on some uh, criteria, um, primarily the ability of the centers to actually be able to initiate all the complex trial machinations um, as early as possible, uh, as well as have, and I'll talk a little bit about it later, about actually having proper outcome uh, assessments and subgroup uh, um, assessments. On the other hand, because you want to look at a broad group of patients, you would also consider doing uh, trials at sites that are uh, perhaps rural. Uh, we'll talk touch a little bit about military, um, both military hospitals as well as uh, combat zones. The idea being that the sites and the patients enrolled at each site will only have the interventions, the domains applied that are appropriate for each um, setting. The idea there is that you're trying to get as much information as you can for every patient uh, uh, subgroup that you're trying to evaluate for, for benefit. The third thing is the time from injury to trial enrollment. Um, there's this idea of uh, immortal time bias, that the, there's that gap in time where patients necessarily have to survive in order to be enrolled, and if you can't narrow that, that time to as little as possible, uh, then essentially they get credit for surviving that period of time before they got enrolled in the study, and that isn't to the benefit of the intervention, it's just they managed to live that long. Um, so it is important to be as efficient as possible with the eligibility screening, the enrollment, and then getting the interventions uh, to the subjects as fast as possible. Um, so other key considerations um, are the idea of competing risk. This is a, a, a challenge when it comes to something like uh, traumatic hemorrhage, uh, because one of the things is that if you have an intervention that provides an early benefit meaning the patients that got the experimental treatment or, or one of the experimental treatments lived past that first phase, they're more likely to be, uh, I mean, they are, they are alive, so they're more exposed to having later outcomes. So paradoxically, an, early, an intervention that provides an early benefit may appear to have a later harm 
and the other group, because they died, there's no evidence of later harm, right? So it, it imbalances your randomization. So there are ways to um, adjust and uh, to anticipate uh, these sorts of competing risks, um, which is complex, but it is something that needs to be considered when, when, uh, when uh, setting up these types of studies. The other thing is about the valid subgrouping variables. So again, you know, we're talking about blunt and penetrating trauma, we're talking about TBI. Those are very broad categories, but how severely injured people are. One of the biggest challenges in uh, trauma systems, and anybody that's seen a trauma registry is familiar with this, is that how you actually assign the severity of injury uh, for, your fat for your fatalities. And the challenge is, is that if you're not getting autopsy reports, if you're not actually scanning patients that, are, that have expired, you don't really know what the extent of the injuries are, and you really aren't able to properly um, group them into how, how severely injured they were. Um, so, so one of the things that you'd really have to consider for an APT would be sites that are able to either perform autopsies on all their fatalities or provide, uh, perform whole body scans to actually assess the full extent of uh, subject injuries. Um, and then the other thing, uh, because the FDA has actually had a keen interest in both uh, adaptive uh, trial designs as well as platform trials, um, having discussions with them throughout the trial, both in the preparation and the conduct, because as things change, it, it, they are a, a interested partner in, in making these trial efficiencies and uh, really become a reality. Okay, this is small. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, but it's, it's in the paper. Uh, but the idea is to just sort of give you a general overview of how um, a traumatic hemorrhage adaptive platform trial would be conducted. Uh, basically from the 911 call um, all the way through patient discharge uh, or rehabilitation. Um, I don't know if the colors are totally visible, but the idea is that there's a trial progression, there's a trial randomization of subjects, and then there's the pre prand uh, response adaptation. As information is gathered about uh, subjects, it feeds back onto the system to uh, provide trial modifications uh, iteratively in a pre-specified manner. Uh, some of the candidate interventions were, there are just examples there. Blood pressure support versus permissive hypotension in the pre-hospital phase, whole blood versus one-to-one-to-one, -to -one -to -one, TXA versus no TXA, and then uh, targeted versus just uh, uh, standard coagulopathy reversal. So, um, so what you would be uh, imagining to happen is that EMS dispatch is when you actually would start collecting data, and ideally that's when you would start screening patients for eligibility. Um, so that would really be moving a lot of the stuff that we do upstream, um, allowing both the pre-hospital personnel, dispatch, and base station uh, providers to actually start doing that initial uh, eligibility uh, evaluation. That also allows data collection to begin, um, such that by the time they actually do uh, uh, get to the medical center, um, they can finish the screening for, el for proper eligibility and all that data hopefully will actually be easily uh, acquired. Um, and then um, the, the other thing that's important to um, provide, to understand is that you know, not everybody that is initially screened is gonna have their data brought into the study, but it does allow a little bit more focus on making sure that the data collection is uh, robust for those early injured patients. So this is just a zoom in into that specific important part of uh, that initial pre-hospital phase. Um, and one of the things with the randomization is that as soon as that first definitive provider has has determined that they're eligible, the randomization can actually begin um, at that phase. And the reason that is helpful, as, as, uh, as uh, Juliana uh, alluded to, is you can randomize patients to hit in a hidden fashion to future interventions, depending on what their injury assessments subsequently are. But it does allow you then to, to make sure that everybody has is, is been uh, randomized to all the appropriate uh, interventions as they become necessary. So what kind of interventions? Again, I talked about um, the permissive hypotension, so that would you know, happen at the pre-hospital phase before the patient even arrives at the hospital. The first outcome would be the you know, uh, mortality within six hours. Um, 
but within that phase, if they manage to live that long, then they'd be randomized in a weighted distribution uh, into the different interventions, right? And you can see that the size of the arrows is different. So part of the response adaptive randomization is that if one arm has a signal of benefit in a pre-specified way, more patients would be randomized into the arm that has benefit to, to determine if that truly is a, a signal of benefit. So there's this idea in an APT that being part of the APT will actually be more beneficial to patients than a traditional two-arm trial because more patients will end up getting the beneficial treatments as part of the, the, the adaptive process. All right, and then the last phase is um, the outcomes. So again, we're looking at death within six hours. Um, all that information gets fed back to help uh, inform future subjects that get enrolled. But then if they manage to live past the, the six hours, then, they'll get, uh, then you would continue to uh, follow them up for more patient-centered outcomes, uh, mortality at 28 days, degree of disability, those kinds of things. Okay, so other things to consider uh, is the inferential challenges. How do, how do you actually uh, demonstrate that there is a benefit. So, um, because patients will have different types of injuries, different sources of bleeding, different severity of injury. Um, again, the, a, a lot of the key to an APT is a lot of preparation. There's a lot of computer simulation that goes into figuring out how big a study you need to do and how you would modify that study as it moves along. But you would plan on uh, se having separate estimates to pre-specified patient subgroups, so you'd obviously need to be able to discern who are those uh, subgroups uh, a priori, but then you would adjust the, the, um, the uh, inferences based on whether those groups actually do differentiate over time or whether it appears that you can pull them together. Um, the other thing is about the changes in effectiveness of care, um, the idea being that as the trial goes on, if other, um, other beneficial arms or interventions are available, how would you bring those in? Um, but the other thing is that you can adjust for secular trends um, if there's other changes that are not part of the, the, the actual trial design. Those are secular trends adjustments. Um, and then the, the possibility that one domain of treatment interventions in one domain can interact with treatments in a, in, a, uh, in a separate domain. So in a very broad way, when you have different domains of treatment and you're providing different interventions in a randomized way between them, it is somewhat like a factorial design, if you guys are familiar with that. And so that separation of randomization does allow you to uh, look for interaction between treatments as well. Um, but it also can look for synergy between treatments, right? And so if you find that there's a combination of treatments that's actually optimal for a patient subgroup, this is the way to do that. That is one of the, the benefits of having a platform trial. So logistical challenges. Um, so there are multiple phases of care. Um, so again, you're talking about screening uh, patients, potentially even enrolling them in the pre-hospital phase, the ED, the OR, the ICU. Um, so so you can imagine, uh, if you've ever done a ride along, that it's hard to, to try to see how you'd be able to operationalize those things. That is definitely one of the challenges of a platform trial for traumatic hemorrhage, but not insurmountable. Um, the key part of it is though that if you do the randomization for later treatments at one single point of randomization, it does allow the, the, the patient flow to be a lot more uh, straightforward as to what is going to happen to a particular patient as they move through the trial. Uh, in terms of the difficulty of integrating data sources, um, so there's already work that's been done that has provided successful linkages between pre-hospital um, health records and, um, and uh, uh, in-hospital uh, uh, electronic health records. Um, so the pipe, pipeline, uh, if those of you that are familiar uh, with the Pittsburgh Initiative or with the LIGHTS trial, both of those groups have managed to demonstrate a way to actually provide uh, data flow between those two um, health record systems. And then using, uh, using longer term data outcomes by pulling in data from uh, the death index, uh, the annual survey of hospitals, uh, and CMMS databases. And then the last but not least, if you're having trouble figuring out 
who your patient is between all those various uh, data sources, there are ways of doing um, probabilistic linkages uh, to rapidly identify patients across those domain, uh, databases. Okay, that was a lot, and I, uh, I, I hope uh, we're able to keep you guys uh, following. My hope is, is I will try to talk about the ethical and regulatory considerations briefly, which is not to minimize them, but um, I think I'd like to hopefully have a more robust discussion with you guys about what you think about this. Um, so I will touch on it as best I can, but I'll try to leave a decent amount of time for, for discussion as well. Um, so the overall idea is when it comes to ethical uh, considerations is that there has to be scientific uh, validity and value. And so what we would argue is that you're trying to maximize the amount of knowledge that you're gaining as well as trying to provide the maximum amount of benefit to patients when doing uh, a, a clinical trial when it comes to traumatic hemorrhage. And so we would argue that an APT uh, would actually both maximize the amount of knowledge gained uh, for every subject enrolled and also maximize the potential benefit to each of those subjects as well. Um, the idea of equitable selection of subjects um, is the idea that the patients most at risk of the disease should be the ones getting enrolled um, as long as um, there isn't um, a, a, uh, a less at risk group that could provide the same amount of information. It's, it, we're not going to be able to get into it much in depth, but you can imagine that trying to glean information about pediatric populations from adult trials is probably not gonna be as informative as we would like. Same idea with pregnant patients, same idea with military members. So the third paper does go into uh, those three uh, uh, special groups uh, in some depth, and I would uh, encourage you to, to look into that. Um, in terms of, uh, again, the, the favorable risk-benefit assessment, um, here we're talking about the principle of beneficence, um, which, uh, again, Given the APT design, we believe it would be more efficient, more likely to benefit individual patients, and so it would meet that, uh, that goal. Um, and then the respect for persons. So this is a challenging thing when it comes to any of these kinds of trials. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, EFIC in a second, but the idea is that these are going to be critically injured patients. They're not going to be able to consent. How do you actually do that process in an ethically sound way? Uh, and so we will... Um, get into that in a, in a, uh, in a little bit. Um, but there are ways of engaging communities in a responsible way uh, when it comes to these types of trials. And given the nature of an adaptive platform trial where the interventions will change over time, you would need to consider going back to the community as the trial evolves. And so it really is more of a conversation than it is just an announcement that we're doing this trial. Uh, so there is a robust, uh, uh, body of information uh, from community partnered participatory research um, where you actually start engaging the community when you're designing the trial to make sure that you're able to both uh, design it in a way that looks for outcomes that matter to them but also can uh, communicate the nature of the trial to to the to the communities uh, impacted in a in a um, in a way that they'll receive it uh, prior uh, studies that have tried to do this these types of consultations have found that the comprehension is low um, when you just go and try to announce this to people because our ability to communicate scientific information to, to communities isn't that great, but this is an area that has uh, improved over time and can, can definitely, we can leverage that, uh, that uh, those uh, best practices. Um, and the last one that I really want to highlight is independent review. I kept mentioning pre-specified. So a lot of this stuff, the people conducting the trial cannot be seeing the data, right? This is one of the big challenges with doing this type of um, these uh, interim analyses uh, is that the data is flowing in to some place, but that place has to be firewalled from the investigators. The group that will actually be doing the pre-specified trial changes have to be separate from the people conducting the study. Um, but that group doing the changes has to be in close contact with the IRB as the protocol changes, as the community consultation changes. All those things are done independently, but do have to be done uh, in a very robust fashion to, to meet the, the, the goals of the trial. Um, 
show of hands who is familiar with eFIC? Okay. Um, so the emergency exception for informed consent is, uh, is how we can enroll patients that are uh, unable to uh, consent at the time uh, that they're being uh, assessed uh, for eligibility um, and you aren't able to contact a legally authorized representative. There's obviously regulations about this, um, but to be able to use uh, EFIC, they can't be consented because of their life-threatening medical condition. The treatments have to be initiated before you're able to contact a legally authorized representative, and there's no reasonable way to identify subjects prospectively. So you can imagine traumatic hemorrhage would, would uh, the patients su suffering from traumatic hemorrhage would, would fall into this group, um, and then they're obviously in a life-threatening situation. So where EFIC really um, falls into place for, for a adaptive platform trial is that there has to be equipoise in what you're doing. So there have to be either um, unproven or unsatisfactory uh, in, uh, in the standard of intervention, and so that's why you're trying to figure out what works and what's best. And there has to be a benefit to the, each subject being enrolled. It is not just to gain information for the next patient, it is to, to, to provide direct benefit to the patient uh, that is being enrolled into the study. Um, and like we pointed out again, that the platform trial, the adaptive platform trial will be randomizing patients toward wherever the signal of benefit is. I did mention the community consultation. Um, again, it's more in depth in the paper, but like I mentioned, the, the one challenge with community consultation with an adaptive platform trial is that there is that uh, changing of treatments would require reconsultation, so it's really more of a, uh, a conversation than it is a consultation. Um, and then the last thing I, I just wanted to talk about very briefly, again, more, uh, more explored more in depth in the paper, is the idea of, of including military research. So the idea had always been that you were either gonna do the study in the military setting or in the civilian setting, but not to do both because they're two different settings. The whole idea for the adaptive platform trial is it is embracing the heterogeneity of setting and, and populations, and it allows you then to do as much, or, or not as much, but do what is appropriate in each setting, and that information is, is uh, informing uh, the, the treatment of the next patients. Um, there is obviously a concern about experimentation on military members, um, and so the paper goes into a, a decent amount of uh, depth about where, where we are in uh, medical military research, what the actual policies uh, and procedures are to potentially do an EFIC study. Uh, it is not prohibited per se, it is just something that needs to be, conversations need to be had, the ethical argument needs to be made. There is no prohibition to do it, but there is a very careful um, consideration that has to happen before we could embark on a, on a study like that in, in, in military uh, uh, settings. Okay, I'm gonna stop there, um, and I hope it was a good overview. I, I, I appreciate that it is very dense, uh, but Let's talk. Who has questions? All right, let me see if I can make this work. Check one. Yeah, so I'm Martin Sintman from Medical City Arlington. So just looking over this with the different confounding factors you kind of mentioned in terms of mechanism and types of injury, in addition with all the arms, do you have any idea of what number of enrollees you would need to appropriately power this trial? Sure, that's a, that's a really good question because it is such a complex trial. Um, so how many enrollees you need for an adaptive platform trial depends a little bit on how many domains and how many factors in those domains you're gonna investigate. Um, but the way we kind of understand what we might need for these complex trials is we do a simulation, so like a full trial simulation before we would even run them to just get a sense of under various circumstances and under various levels of treatment efficacy, how many patients you would need. But it, it, it's highly variable, and most of these trials actually, like the ones I mentioned, like REMAP-CAP, 
um, might have started with fewer sites and as they added domains and as they added their COVID appendix in the pandemic, then expanded the number of sites and patients they had. So part of what that also touches on is the idea of a learning health system, which you may have heard of before, the idea that you actually take information that you learn about every single patient and it informs both their care and future patients' care. And one of the things about an adaptive platform trial, if well-reasoned and, and, and deployed, is actually taking that learning health system and bringing research into the learning health system where each patient is not, is not only getting the most cutting edge care, cutting edge care, but is actually then informing the care of future patients. Other questions? Hey, Rob. Uh, so this is really beautiful. I mean, I've watched different parts of this develop over time, and I hadn't seen how far you've gotten. And I'm really, I'm really impressed. It really looks good. Well, some of the aspects you didn't talk about here might be in the paper. Uh, masking of interventions and placebos. So you've got a common control group, but you don't have common placebos, but you don't necessarily have placebos in all your arms anyway. So how do you deal with masking, especially if, you know, the, the placebo group of one step of randomization is eligible for subsequent randomization and the other one might not be? So, so that's why I avoided saying that it actually is a factorial design, because there are clearly combinations of treatments that wouldn't, wouldn't be allowable, um, particularly if it comes to patients that require surgery or, or something, and a protect, potential intervention would, would be contraindicated or would prevent uh, a future surgery. So when you do the randomization, there has to be uh, pre-planned uh, how different randomizations would, would, would route. Um, Dr. Tolles, I don't know if you had other thoughts on that. Um, no, I agree. I mean, it, it depends on the domain, how you're going to do masking. And obviously, yeah, some a group that's in the control group, which is not placebo necessarily standard of care for one domain, would be eligible for an experimental treatment in another domain. And, and how you do masking is just going to depend on, on each domain. So, so it honestly goes without saying that you, you really do need a lot of people weighing in from all the different uh, experts on the domains that you're involving because you want to be able to anticipate when you do the simulations, when you actually do the trial designs, when you actually create those pre-specified triggering rules, what you're going to do in the real trial. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is to have a real honest uh, understanding of how things are actually working, what our knowledge is to, that, that we're starting with, not having very like overly optimistic treatment benefits like and being very uh, thoughtful about every step of that process. It is very complex to do these trial simulations, um, but it allows for a really robust trial to move forward that will actually answer some very important questions because all these one-to-one -one trials only answer one part of the optimum treatment for traumatically injured uh, patients. And what you really want to know is what is the combination of treatments that is really going to help the patient in front of you. Other questions? Okay. All right. Oh, Rob, Rob has another question. Oh. No. So, and I think you got at this in site selection, but I missed what your conclusion was. Um, from an operational standpoint, all sites might not be able to do all interventions. Um, so, and you, you, so do you, you accommodate that ahead of time that, that some sites might jump to the second randomization because they weren't able to do the first one or vice versa. Right, so, so some of this also kind of touches on the idea that not all sites would be willing to do all domain interventions, randomizations, if you, know, you have a, a particular uh, person at a facility that believes that this is the way that they're gonna treat all their traumatically injured patients, you don't randomize on that arm, but you are still collecting information based on what interventions they did get, so they are essentially a on one domain, they may not be randomized, but on the other domain, they are getting randomized. So it still provides information. Uh, the important part of that, I, I would argue, is that it, it provides patient phenotypes as well as site phenotypes. So you can imagine in a critical access hospital, there just simply aren't some of those domain interventions. They are fixed. So you want to know what's best for those patients, and that's what uh, having those heter heterogeneous settings uh, would also 
uh, provide benefit and information to certain groups of patients. Yeah, I think it's a really important point you touch on, though, because when we sit down with clinicians, especially across the country, their first point of panic is like, well, you know, my colleagues at X have like this quasi-religious belief in this particular treatment, and they're never going to randomize, and we'll never be able to do the trial. And you say, no, it's okay. Like, they can participate in the domains that they're able to, either feasibility-wise or institutional and culturally-wise, and the trial can be flexible in that way, and that is an important point of education. Okay. I think there's food coming for the next group. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, guys.